Okay, good morning. We are ready to begin. We will review the compiler's foreword, in other words, what the Alter Rebbe, the author of the Tanya, wrote himself, where he explains the purpose for this, for this project. The project is a book of ethical advice, as we'll see in the letter. This was originally composed as a letter from the Alter Rebbe to the community of Hasidim explaining the new order. As we said last time, in order to get advice from the, from the Rebbe himself, from the Alter Rebbe, the author of the Tanya, you had to stand in line, you had to register, you had to, you had to uh, be tested by your local expert, and then you had to be tested by your regional expert, and then you had to be tested by the uh, by headquarters expert, and only then could you uh, get a meeting with the Alter Rebbe himself to gain advice, because in this way, the Alter Rebbe was trying to minimize, the Alter Rebbe was trying to minimize the number of times people would have to meet with him privately. Yeah? Because his goal was to to be very efficient in his instruction and that his students should be very efficient in receiving instruction. So he wanted to make sure that the students were ready to hear what he had to say before they even entered his room. In general, a student in the times of the Alter Rebbe would have two, maybe three private meetings with the Alter Rebbe and that's it. In the first meeting, the initial meeting, the rule was you had to talk about the Talmud that you were studying. For whatever reason, the Alter Rebbe understood that the first connection between himself and his students would have to be on the revealed level of Torah. Talmud, Jewish law, the first thing you had to do is you'd, ha you'd have to come with a question, a profound question that you had in what you were studying in Talmud or in Jewish law, and the Alter Rebbe would address that issue for you and that would be the end of the story. And then the next time you would meet, again, after all that preparation, the next, the, the following meeting, the second meeting, the Alter Rebbe would give a person an outline for how they should approach their service of God based on their soul type, based on their personality and their character. And then the person would have to spend the following years or decades implementing the Rebbe's advice. What ended up happening in later years, as we will see, is that uh, students would come back again and again asking for advice on the same issue. And the Alter Rebbe said, I can't do that anymore. It's not, it's not a useful use of my time. And the, and the crowd has grown so large that, I'm, that the Alter Rebbe was having trouble making time to meet people even the first time. Uh, and therefore, the Alter Rebbe switched and put all the advice into, a, into the written form so that students could study his guidance, learn from him, and, uh, and understand uh, what the Rebbe would advise them if they would come and ask their question. And the Alter Rebbe, the Alter Rebbe promised, sort of, that every issue is addressed in these pages. Every ethical issue, every question about personal growth, every question about spiritual growth, every question about self-doubt and self-confidence, every question about what's the correct approach to everyday living, what is the incorrect approach to everyday living, it's all included in this compilation. You might ask a question. The Rebbe was writing to a generation that had, first of all, tremendous students. That means he was writing to talented and pious people. And that will leave us with some doubt. Then, uh, then how, how do we apply this to ourselves when we are not particularly pious or particularly spiritually talented? first question and the second question is if even those in that generation who were not personally talented or particularly spirit spiritually talented or particularly pious 
at least in their neighborhoods, they had people who were exceptionally holy, pious, and spiritually talented, who could guide them through the pages of the Tanya. And the answer will also be found in the pages of this, of this. The answer will also be found in this letter, this introduction to the book of Tanya. The answer to both of those questions. And now we begin. Very excited to start again. Now for the second time only. Compilers forward. As we've seen from the title page, the Alter Rebbe perceives himself merely as a compiler rather than as the author of this book in his humility. This is a letter that was sent. He igeres hashlucha lechlolos anshei shlemenu. Hashem should bless them. This is a letter to the members of our community. Hashem should bless them and guard them. Aleichem, oopsie, aleichem ishim ekra. You, Worthy people, I call to you. Shimu Eli, listen to me. Reut Feit Tzedek, those who pursue righteousness. Mevakshe Hashem, those who seek God. Vayishma Aleichem Elekim, and Hashem will listen to you. Limigodel Viad Katan, from the greatest in spiritual stature to the smallest in spiritual stature. This letter is addressed to to all Anash, to all the members of our community in our land and in nearby countries. The music today is brought to you by Maryasha. Ish al may each of us dwell in his own place in peace. And uh, achieve eternal life. Netzach means forever. Sela means forever. And Vaed means forever. Amen. Can you hear us? And so may it be God's will. That's the Alter Rebbe's opening. And of course, in this opening, we see who the Alter Rebbe is addressing. And let's pay very, very close attention. First of all, if you're reading this letter, the Alter Rebbe calls you Ishim. If you're already reading... If you're already reading, you are worthy to do so. The principle of Tanya that the Rebbe taught us, that our Rebbe taught us, is that every word of Tanya applies to every living person. Which means if you're already reading this letter, then the expression Ishim, which means worthy people, worthy students, applies to you. should not feel excluded because we're not talented. What else does the Alter Rebbe call us? Because we're reading this letter, he calls us Anche Shlemenu. He calls us members of his fellowship, his Hasidim. What else does the Alter Rebbe call us because we're reading this letter? Ruid Feit Tzedek, pursuers of righteousness. Okay. These are not titles, yeah? These are not titles that we have earned. These are descriptions of the kind of person that the Rebbe knows we can be and expects us to try to be in order that we will succeed in implementing the things that we study in this book. We are members of his community. We are his Hasidim, but that's just the starting point. And the Rav of Cleveland has a son-in-law named Rabbi Sharf, Mendel Sharf. He's a, tr he's a, a person that's, a, that's deeply devoted to the Rebbe and the Rebbe's projects. And over Sukkot, he was here in town, and he told me that his father, when people would ask him, are you a chassid of the Lubavitcher Rebbe? He would say, I'm working on it. He'd been a chassid for a long time. He'd say, I'm working on it. And that's a true thing. We are Hasidim, 
because we have approached, because we have put ourselves to the task of finding the truth, finding the correct way to serve Hashem according to our talents, our abilities, our personalities, our characters. But to be a chassid, like uh, chassidim always said, if, you, if today is the same as yesterday, or to be more precise, chassidim say, today cannot possibly be like yesterday. Unacceptable. It's unacceptable that today should be the same as yesterday. Today has to be completely different than yesterday. Or in Yiddish, they say, today has to be gor andersh, completely different. That's the work. That is the work. That's the life of a chassid. It's nice to, it's nice to be a chassid. That's only the starting point. Now, every day has to be completely different than the day before. Because we've grown. Having lived 24 hours, it's, it's not worth nothing. 24 hours of life is a tremendous learning opportunity. 24 hours of life, you could achieve tremendous things. All the lessons you learned yesterday have to be applied to your service of Hashem and your care for your family and your community and your service to the project and the purpose of creation today. If, God forbid, a person learned something yesterday and didn't apply it to their life today, you know, for a chassid, that's not acceptable. And a chassid means a person that's committed to living life in the most meaningful way. So the Rebbe called us his Hasidim. The Rebbe called us worthy students. And the Rebbe called us those who pursue righteousness. And what's righteousness? <laughs> righteousness in Torah means those who seek to do the just thing. When we're talking about caring for people, the just thing is like Hasidim say, what's mine is yours. Or that's what the Mishnah says. The Mishnah says, what's mine is yours. But the students of the Alter Rebbe would say, this piece of bread that I have is yours as much as it's mine. They switched the order. You hear this? It's a very subtle difference. But it's very telling. This piece of bread that I have is yours as much as it's mine. The Mishnah says, what's mine is yours. The Hasidim said, it's yours as much as it's mine. And they said, yours before mine. The justice. And in the, in the fourth section of Tanya, the Rebbe goes into tremendous detail about what the Hasidic perspective of justice is. In, in very short, you can sum it up in one sentence. Everything God has given you is in order to serve God, your community, and the world. To serve your purpose. Nothing did Hashem give you so that you should use it just for yourself. No such thing. That a person... This soundtrack is brought to you by Shalom. Uh, a person who knows this and is pursuing this attitude, yes, knowing something and having that attitude are different things. That's different levels. Knowing that everything Hashem gave you is in order to serve Him and really seeing the world that way, that's very different. And that's why we're called pursuers of righteousness. We know this. We don't have to be told this. We know it very well. We're here. <laughs> we're learning the Tanya. Why? Because uh, we have nothing else to do on a Tuesday morning. Plenty to do on a Tuesday morning. We're here because we want to we wanna achieve something in our, in our minds and in our hearts. And it seems often that we are told things that we know. And we're told the same things over and over and over. But it's clear to understand that uh, the reason we are told these things over and over and over is because we're trying to develop an attitude, not just knowledge. We're not just trying to accumulate knowledge. 
We're trying to develop a personality of a servant of God. And that's called Ruid Feitzedek, the pursuers of righteousness. Mevakshe Hashem, who seek God. We know that God exists. That's not the question. That's not the question. Who created heaven and earth? God, you knew it since you were born. In one form or another. We're not looking for awareness of God. We're looking for the attitude of the servant of God. And the Alter Rebbe says, if you will listen to me, you'll succeed in, their, in your work and God will listen to you. What kind of prayer do we have on our, on our lips as we approach the study of Tanya? Um, we'll take a very short commercial break. Chayala, shut the fire on the stove, please. We're back. Homeschooling day. This is fantastic. <laughs> what is the prayer that we have on our lips when we are approaching the study of Tanya? And I want to hear from you. I want to hear from you. This is my son, Shalom. <laughs> yeah, I want to hear from you. I think you all have the ability to unmute yourselves. We're approaching the study of Tanya now. Yeah, some of us have been through this before. Why are we here? What are we praying to Hashem for? <laughs> yes. Hold on, hold on. Oh. Okay, run. This is important. This is important. Yes, Laura. Um, just a swag. Figuring out um, what Hashem wants from us will mm -hmm. help me to um, to understand better what I should be doing. Um, <clears throat> and I think that I'll get some of that from this, uh, a lot of that from this. Under, understanding the whole scheme of things and where I fit in. Um, this is my first time, I really don't, I'm not sure. <laughs> you asked what the prayer on her lips was? Yep. As we start to learn Tanya from the beginning. God help me. God help you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> yeah. Anything specific or just God help me, period? God help me, period. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. The orange is like, okay. Okay. Right. okay. So, okay. We, about what Laura said, we know, we know the big picture, yes? Is there any doubt that Hashem wants you to light candles on Friday night? There's no doubt. No. That's not what we're talking about. Perhaps, uh, perhaps is the question, why does God want me to light candles on Friday night? I'm asking. I don't know that that's your question. Um, why does God want? Not really. Okay. He said, he said, what's my role in the big picture? Right, right. It's like, there's a lot of things that are going on. Actually, maybe that is, that I don't, I don't know why. I don't know. I don't know anything, basically. <laughs> very, very interesting. It, no, it's lots of cool times. Stop it. It happens, <laughs> it happens sometimes. I got you. It happens sometimes. I'm turning off the mic because uh, uh, there's some background noise. It happens sometimes that a Jew is doing what they have to do and they cannot believe in all honesty that that's it. I lit my candles. I said my prayers. I raised my kids. That's all I have to do? Isn't there supposed to be some tremendous cosmic something or another Something huge, something monumental, something moving. All I did was light a candle. That's it. All I did was say a bracha. That's it. It seems if we're trying to fulfill the grand master plan for creation, 
it seems that the bits and pieces that God has commanded each of us to do it seems a little small. I, I'm, I'm, I'm following the orders. I'm not arguing. But is that all I'm supposed to do? There's another question. And the question is, if my hands and feet are obedient and my heart and mind are detached, am I still in, am I still in the game? Does it still count? Is it still real? Uh, Laura, am I close? God, I'm trying to unmute your mic. No, you have to unmute it. Yeah. Um, yeah, kind of. It's a struggle, you know. It's a struggle always having your your head in it, um, and it's it's something. I I think that it counts no matter what. What you know, that's what I've been told. It 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 matters. Everything that we do matters, obviously. But um, it's a struggle of keeping my mind and being mindful about everything that I do. Um, you know, davening whatever, you know, having, I don't know. Okay, good. We, we'll ask this question uh, by in, in, in almost every chapter that we learn, we're going to ask the same question. What are we exactly, okay. what exactly are we looking for? What is, what is the question that the Alter Rebbe is addressing, that the Alter Rebbe is addressing in this chapter? Okay. Okay. I, well, I can't. I cannot ask permission from from. Well, let me ask permission anyway. Because uh, Mary Ellen shared her thoughts in the text because she's not able to. She's not able to speak. I wonder if I. I'm asking her permission. No, nope, not to you. Wrong person. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, Randy, go ahead, please. Hmm. I didn't, I, I was, what did I, oh, it's a general kind of thing so far. You said he wrote these things to reach everybody. So we're, of course, we're all going to take whatever it is in our own way. Whatever it is Hashem wants us to learn in this world or accomplish in this world. This is like a guide. It's a, it's a different dimension of the rest of the Torah. That's all I got. So I'll share with you, I'll share with you th three anecdotes. It happened one time that a young man uh, entered the Alter Rebbe's room. He actually climbed in through the window because he didn't want to go through the whole process. And he entered the Rebbe's room and he says to the Rebbe, I can't take it anymore. I need you to murder my evil inclination. <laughs> and on that single occasion, the Alter Rebbe did it. He did it. He said certain verses from the Torah and he chopped off the man's evil inclination. Some of us are looking for that. Some of us are looking for a cure to our humanness. I wish I could just be even. I wish I could just be consistent. I wish it wasn't such a struggle every morning to do the thing that I accomplished yesterday easily. Today, it's a struggle for me. That's frustrating. That's aggravating. That's disheartening. That's one case. In another case, uh, a man who in his community was considered a tremendous scholar and a tremendous tzaddik, righteous man, a pious man. He begins to study with the Alter Rebbe. He begins to study Tanya. And he said, after a while, he came to the following conclusion. He says, when I was in my old community, I was convinced that I was a tzaddik, perfect tzaddik. Then I started to learn Tanya. And I realized, maybe not a perfect tzaddik, 
maybe just like a like an average tzaddik as we'll learn in the first chapter what that means and then i learned some more and i realized mm, maybe not a tzaddik at all maybe i'm a bainani as we'll learn what that means and at the end he said after learning more i re i came to the conclusion that i could only hope to be a bainani Some of us are looking for that. Some of us want to know if I'm going to serve God for the next 70 years with Hashem's help. I want to, I want to achieve something. How do I mark success? How do I, how do I plan my advance towards a greater connection with God? A step-by-step, -step, a good, clear pathway so that I'm not running in circles. Some of us are looking for that. That's not me making the noise, Belinda. That's me. That's that. Uh, yeah, the percussion is presented by Shalom in the background. <laughs> Hello. And then one more, one more anecdote. Hello. And that is that a chassid was sitting in shul. Let's let's we'll reframe it. Hello. A man walks into shul one Shabbos. <laughs> And he sees in the corner, there's an old man. There's an old man sitting with a talus over his shoulder, studying before davening. And that's a little strange in some communities. Usually the first thing you do in the morning is, is daven. You don't study before you daven. I mean, you got to get the davening. You got to have to, you're obligated to pray right away. So it was, it was new for him to see a person studying before davening. He noticed the man was davening even he noticed the man continued studying even once the prayers began and the community starts praying he noticed that this man continued studying and he noticed that as the community was going to have kiddush after the davening was over the man was still with his talus over his shoulder folded still over his right shoulder and the man was still studying and at the end of the kiddush when the community was going home, he noticed that the man was still sitting in the same place with his talus folded neatly on his right shoulder, studying. He came over to the man to try to look into the book. What was he studying? The man looked up at him and he said, I know what you want. You want to see the hand of the maker in the product. The man said, the man, in one second, the man says, you got me. You have defined me. Some of us are looking for that. We want to see God's hand in everything. We want to know that God is here. We want to know that God is available. We want to know that God is interested. We want to know that God is really paying attention and that we really do matter. We've heard it again. This is not something we don't know. We know this. But there's a difference between knowing about it and really knowing it, owning that knowledge to the point where it affects our behavior and our attitude and the way we go about our day. These are just three of the 600,000 things that people might be looking for when they approach the study of Tanya. We might be looking for a good roadmap of how to serve God. We might be looking for the comfort of knowing that God is in our lives always. And we might be looking for a cure to our humanness, a cure to our struggles. Won't the Torah just tell me, how can I deal with my weaknesses, my challenges, and so on? Those are just three. And as we learn more, we'll, we'll bring up more anecdotes and we'll see that there are many reasons that people will approach the study of Tanya and all of them or most of them will resonate with all of us at some level. And they're all good and they're all good and valid reasons to learn Tanya. And the truth is you don't even need a reason to learn Tanya. It's fascinating. <laughs> Girls. We're going to continue in the text of the letter. I need this, please.
Ine. Where are we? No, no. Ine. Mudas Zois, it's well known. Ki Margela Mipume di Inche Bechola Nashlemer, that uh, all Hasidim often say, Ki Eino Deme Shmi. <laughs> Hearing words of guidance from the Rebbe himself. Time out. Time out. Hearing moral guidance from a teacher, from the Rebbe himself, is incomparably greater than reading his guidance in any kind of book. And the Rebbe accepts that, and he explains even, he defends that position from, two, from various perspectives. He says, first of all, that a person reading a book, he's gonna read it with his, own, with his own biases. He's gonna read it from his own perspective. Yeah? Then you can't really be certain that the way you understood what was written on the page is actually what the author intended. Firstly. Secondly, a person reading is certainly not often, often. The reader is certainly not as well versed in the subject matter as the author is. Certainly if we're talking about holy tzaddikim writing a moral guidance for the average Jew, the average Joe, certainly our intellect is not the same as a person whose mind has been purified by the fire of Torah. And we're going to struggle, we're going we're to work hard, and we'll understand it to the best of our ability, but the best of our ability is exactly that. It's the best of our ability. And a third thing, that is on a good day when we're able to concentrate and understand properly. What about a difficult day when we're anxious and we're confused? We're wandering around in darkness when it comes to the ideas pertaining to the service of God. We don't know which way is up. As the Alter Rebbe himself once asked a bright student. He posed a question to him. The father of this student complained that the student was particularly arrogant. And the Alter Rebbe said, bring him to me. The Alter Rebbe posed a question to him. And the student said, yeah, that's a wonderful question. Couldn't find an answer. And the Alter Rebbe answered it for him. And he said, well, that's a wonderful answer, a beautiful answer. And the Alter Rebbe proceeded to disprove the answer he had just given. And the young man said, wow, that was a great rebuttal. I, I, didn't, I couldn't think of that myself. And the Alter Rebbe solved the rebuttal, answered the rebuttal. And the young man said, wow, that was brilliant. Very good. And the Alter Rebbe disproved his, uh, his answer to the rebuttal. And the young man said, I couldn't, so I couldn't, I don't know, I can't solve that. So the Alter Rebbe solved it. And back and forth a few times, 10 times, the Alter Rebbe questioned, answered, rebuffed, answered, rebutted. That's not a word, rebutted, rebuffed. Answered back and forth 10 times. And at the end, gave such a simple, simple answer that was almost on the level of just translate the sentence correctly and all of these questions go away. Yeah? And then the Alter Rebbe said, do you think that the authors of the Talmud had to go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth 10 times in order to find this truth? We walk in darkness and they walk in the light. It's like the difference between trying to find the door in a dark room and trying to find the door when the lights are on. When you walk in the light, you see the door, you walk right to it. 
when you're in the dark, you have to try every surface. You bump into the wall 10 times. Yeah, you, you pick a direction and you march and you hit a wall. So you change course and you march. And again, you hit a wall. Change course again and you march. And you hit a window. Close. It's like a door, but it's not exactly. You, 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 yeah. You, you pound your head into the wall time and again and again and again. Because, you know, when it comes to the matters of spiritual growth, character development, and certainly the service of Hashem, we are not walking in the light. We are walking in darkness. And that's the value of going to the Rebbe, a person, who's, who, a person for whom the lights are on. He sees the door and he can point you right to it. One moment, please. Isn't that funny? Right when he said that, the door would knock. He had a knock on the door. Okay. They're doing construction on the street. They told us they're going to shut off our water. It's an exciting yeah, day. Yes. As soon as you, is that when you were reading... Right as you said, Hashem will lead you to the door, you had a knock on your door? Is that what hey, just happened? That's what just happened. <laughs> Some of us are very literal. <laughs> that's cool. Yeah. So that's the value of going to the Rebbe. You get, uh, uh, you get, you know, he'll, he'll, he'll point you to the door and you walk right to it. Then, then, the Rebbe doesn't get confused, yeah? Sometimes the Rebbe points us to the door, and we march right to it, and we hit a wall anyway. But for a person that's, walk, for a person that's, that's walking in the light, that's not confusing, and it's not discouraging. We heard, we heard, from, from, we heard recently a story, several stories. And it was even published in a video where people were advised by the Rebbe that in order to address a certain issue in their lives, they should check their mezuzahs. And they came back and they said, we checked them and everything's fine. And the Rebbe said, check them again. So they checked them again. And they came back and said, everything's fine. The Rebbe said, it's impossible that I told you to check your mezuzahs and you didn't find anything wrong with your mezuzahs. Check them again. Bring him to a new sofa. Because for the Rebbe, the lights are on and I see it. There's something wrong with your mezuzah. Don't tell me there's nothing wrong with your mezuzah. There's something wrong with your mezuzah. Go find it. Oh, because he didn't find it the first time and the second time and the third time. So I'm going to get confused and thrown off the road? No. No, not for the tzaddik. The lights are on and he sees clearly. There's no confusion. There's no doubt. That's the value of going to the Rebbe. But if I'm going to read the Rebbe's letter or I'm going to read the Rebbe's teachings and the Rebbe is not there with his confidence and his clarity, the best I can do is look at the Rebbe's words through my own mind. And sometimes my own mind is, is muddled. Yeah, maybe I'll take it the wrong way. Maybe I'll misunderstand it. Maybe I'll understand it perfectly and give it the old college try and hit a wall anyway and say, oh, that must not be the right way. If the Rebbe is there, the Rebbe can tell you, you did it right or you did it wrong. Keep going on the same road or adjust and try a different road. But if you're just reading and the Rebbe is not there personally to guide you, it's a tremendous deficiency in the guidance. Yeah, and that's what the Rebbe continues. It's very difficult to see the light, the very, very good light, Hagonos Besfarim, that is hidden behind the words written in a book. Even if the light as you're reading it is so beautiful to look at, even as we're learning. And this is an experience we have very, very often. 
We learn, and it's a delight to learn, and it lights up our lives, and it soothes our souls, and we leave the room, and we're back where we started. <laughs> that happens. It's hard to see the light. It's hard to see the direction clearly, even if it's so delightful to read these holy words. Okay, that's the Alter Rebbe defending the complaint from the Hasidim that if the Rebbe is going to put all his guidance in a book, he, we are, we'll, we'll be left with a tremendous deficiency in the Rebbe's guidance because of the reasons that he said above. Ubar Mindain, aside from the aforementioned uh, deficiencies in having the guidance in written form, he says there are different kinds of books with ethical guidance. There are books of, of moral advice and guidance that are based on intelligence. Even among, we're talking about Torah books. We're not talking about, we're not talking about uh, self-help books that you find at Barnes and Nobles. We're talking about Torah books written by Torah scholars, but they didn't write it from a perspective of Torah scholarship. They are arguing for the moral path of Torah which is a valid approach. And in certain generations, it's highly important because that's the language of the generation. So they were all about logic. They were all about, okay, all about um, winning the argument. And so you had generations of rabbis, of great Torah scholars, I'm still teaching, of great Torah scholars who wrote books that are purely logical, not based on not based on the Torah's truth, not, not that there's not the Torah's truth in it, but they didn't, they didn't basing all their arguments on the Torah's truths. They're basing their arguments on logic, right? The, the, the best example is Rambam. Maimonides wrote a book called The Guide for the Perplexed, and he never said, this is true because Torah said so. Yeah, in his generation, he couldn't get away with that. That's his belief. You can see it in all his other writings. Rambam has no doubt in the truth of Torah, not because it makes sense to him, but because he believes in the truth of Torah. But in his book of philosophy and ethical guidance called Guide for the Perplexed, he couldn't, he, that was not the language that he had to use for his generation. He had to use a philosophical language. He had to use the, the logical approach. So you have those books. Those books certainly will not have the same effect on all people. I'll read a logical argument and I'll be very moved by it. And you'll read on a logical argument and, and, and it won't touch you at all. And a third person will read the same argument and he'll think it's nonsense. And a fourth person... Because the difference in human intellect, because of the differences between people, a single argument is not going to satisfy all people. It's not going to affect all people in the same way. Because not all intellects and not all minds are alike. For example, very, very simple example from the, from the uh, Jewish uh, the stories of our people. You have a convert who comes to convert and he goes to Shammai and Shammai tells him that the entire Torah, ta-da, that the entire Torah is love your neighbor as yourself. That's the entire Torah. The man says, that's insane. He goes to Hillel and Hillel tells him the exact same thing, but his presentation was different. He says, do, he says, what you don't like, don't do to somebody else, which is synonymous with love thy neighbor as thyself. Be as kind to another as you would be kind to yourself. And he said, whoa, that's great. In addition to that, Let's say you have two people that are already convinced of the same argument. 
they already hold the same perspective. They already agree on the basic principles. But every once in a while you need a refresher. Every once in a while you want to be inspired again so that you have more energy to, to, to go forward, to go forward in your service of Hashem. Yeah, and you have two people sitting in the same gathering and the, uh, the lecturer is lecturing his, his heart out to the best of his ability. And one person in the audience is utterly moved and inspired. Somebody else in the audience said, that was absolutely boring. He just repeated and regurgitated what I heard a thousand times. He didn't say anything wrong. He didn't say anything you disagree with. It's just the minds of people are so different that you cannot inspire everybody at the same way with the same arguments. Hi, please make a baby. As the sages have taught us in the Talmud, regarding the bracha that you have to say, when you see 600,000 Jews in one place, you have to bless Hashem for being able to address the minds and the attitudes and the perspectives of each and every individual on their on their particular way. God himself can do this. Who else? Among the humans, Moshe Rabbeinu can do this. That's why Moshe Rabbeinu prayed before he passed away that God should appoint a successor that would be able to Lead all the people. Let's read. That's why we bless Hashem. When we see 600,000 people, 600,000 Jews, we praise Hashem for knowing the secrets of all of them. As uh, I don't remember if it was Golda Meir who said, imagine 3 million Jews in one place, try to be the prime minister of 3 million prime ministers. Yeah. <laughs> Um, because the minds of people and everyone is different and Hashem knows each one of them and Nachmanides, Ramban explained regarding um, a, a, the Medrash what it says about Yehoshua Isha Sheruach Boy the, the man that has the spirit in him, what's the spirit? he said, the, the Medrash says sheyochel lehalich neged ruchei shel kol echad v'yechad He's able to meet the spirit of each person. It's very difficult. It's impossible. You have your perspective. And as much as you try to facilitate, and as much as you try to be open, and as much as you try to be understanding of other people's perspectives, a human being is stuck in their paradigm. And, and you could and you be flexible, but how much? And that is the issue with one type of book, one category of moral teachings, the kind that's based on logic. We all have our perspectives, and we were not. And, we'll, and some things will move us, some things won't. Some things move other people, other and they and other and, but they won't move us. But even books, says the Alta Rebbe, even books that are based, that are founded on the truth of Torah, where you go through the book and it says, this is the correct approach because Torah said so. Where does Torah say so? Here's a Pasuk. Here's a quote from Chumash. Here's a quote from the Prophets. Here's a quote from the Medrash. Here's a quote from the Talmud. Now you know for certain that this is the right path. I've showed you a, 10 different ways that the Torah says that that's the right path. It's confidence building. You don't have to convince anybody. Even so, wait, let's read the author of his words. Even works of Musar, ethical teachings, whose foundation is in the truth of Torah, the peaks of holiness, meaning that they are founded on they're based on the teachings of the sages in whom the spirit of God speaks and his word is on their tongue. Even in such cases, 
yeah, where it's based on and Torah and the Holy One, blessed be He, are completely one. The Torah is part is a part of God, and every Jewish soul is a part of the Torah, and the Torah connects the Jewish soul with God. There is no doubt. You have absolute clarity and confidence in the truth of Torah. Says the Alter Rebbe, the argument still stands that a book is not as good as face to face with your teacher because the Torah's messages are said in a general way to the whole people. The question, how do I fit in particularly, specifically, still remains. It's true that Torah lends itself to interpretation, general interpretation, a more specific interpretation, a very specific interpretation, and in a manner that applies specifically to every individual Jewish soul that's rooted in the Torah. The Torah lends itself to that particular person's appetite to be able to be taught and to be able to deliver the truth to that person. Where are we? Vihine, still, what is, what's the reality? Even in the most clear-cut, simple areas of Jewish law that are meant to be the revealed and obvious part of Torah. Even in these laws, we see arguments where one teacher argues with another teacher and they find themselves on polar opposites of a decision. One person says, eat it, it's kosher. And the other one says, if you eat it, your soul is cut off from the Jewish people and destroyed forever. And that's in the obvious portion of Torah. Can you imagine the complexity, the, the difficulty of finding your path in the esoteric portion? In the ethical portion, you need a Rebbe. You have to have a person who walks in the light to guide you, specifically you, according to your soul. As the Rebbe once said about a meeting that he had with Ariel Sharon, he had a meeting, and they spent hours discussing Israeli politics. And at the end, the Rebbe said, when is your flight? He says, I leave this afternoon. The Rebbe said, why don't you stay a couple days? And uh, he thought nothing of it. He left the room. Ariel Sharon left the Rebbe's room. And uh, the young men who are always hungry to hear new, new, new messages from the Rebbe, they attacked Ariel Sharon. They, they didn't attack him. They, uh, what's it called? They cornered him and they demanded to know what they was, what they had discussed, what had been discussed in that meeting. And Arik Sharon says, I can't tell you anything. It's all top secret stuff, uh, you know, Israeli military and government stuff. But uh, i just tell you that this Rebbe is very, very polite. He's very nice. He's a real gentleman. You know, I told him my flight is today. And he said, he, he was so polite. He said, why don't you stay a few more days? And the young man in the yeshiva said, the Rebbe was not being polite. The Rebbe says, stay a couple of days. Stay. You stay. And they had to work on him a while until they convinced him that he has to stay. And the flight that he was meant to be on was hijacked. They landed somewhere in the in Africa, North Africa. They held the plane for, for uh, I don't remember if it was 45 minutes or an hour and 45 minutes, a very short time, and they let it go. They didn't take hostages. They didn't make demands. It's pretty clear, pretty clear that they were looking for Ariel Sharon. And he wasn't on the plane. The way I heard the story, the Rebbe was asked, why didn't you warn us that the plane was going to get hijacked? The Rebbe said, I didn't know the plane was going to get hijacked. A soul, a, a Jewish soul, not a Jewish soul. Uh, there's a person in front of me, and I have a sense what that person needs to hear, and I say it. 
and that's to each individual. That's not in a general way. The Torah teaches us in a general way, and then it's up to us to find ourselves particularly, specifically in the big picture. But if you're in, in the presence of a Rebbe, the Rebbe looks at you as an individual, and he can see the pathway for you. And he can point you right at it. And he can say, why don't you stay a few more days? Why don't you check your mezuzahs? We'll finish this part of the argument in the Alter Rebbe's words, and when we meet again next week, we will continue. Yes, yes, there are many, many polar opposite arguments, and yet they are all valid in Torah. That's why it's called Divrei Elikim Chayim. Very strange language in general in the Torah. The word Elikim means it's translated as God. It's a name for God, but it's a plural word. So technically we're saying... These, both of these arguments are the words of the living gods, which in, in Judaism is, is not acceptable. And how can we have a, how can we have a name of God that is in the plural, in, that is in Loshen Rabim in plural form? That name of God represents God as the source of all the souls of the Jewish people and all the arguments in the Torah. Which generally are divided into three categories. There we go. Generally divided into three categories. Right, left, and center, which are kindness, severity, and compassion, which make up the basic character traits of each of these neshamas. And therefore, a person whose soul is rooted in the attribute of kindness, when it comes to the question of Jewish law, they tend to be lenient. And a person whose character, whose soul is rooted in the attribute of severity and discipline tends towards strict, strictness, stringency. And that's in halacha, in the obvious section. Certainly, Certainly, how much more so when it comes to the matters that are hidden to Hashem, the inun, the chilu, the chimu, particularly love and fear of Hashem, the bemoicha v'liba, the chol chad lefum shiyere delay, which exists and has to be achieved by every person according to their own personal, particular ability and soul type, lefum ma de mishayir belibe, whatever he could estimate and whatever he could allow through into his heart. As it's described in the Zohar on the verse, her husband is known by the gates that a person is known by, a person will be able to achieve spiritually, a person will be able to accomplish only whatever is their, their hearts and minds are capable of seeing, capable of experiencing. That's the end. That's the end of that argument where the Alter Rebbe is saying to the Hasidim, I hear you. I told you I'm making a book of advice in place of our personal meetings. You argued to me that that's a terrible idea. I hear you and I understand. And when we come back next week, we'll read how the Alter Rebbe answers that argument and explains how this book is actually going to be fantastically successful and very, very useful for all those who are seeking Hashem in earnest. Okay. Thank you all for joining. Randy, do you want to tell us what you were sharing a moment, a moment ago? Hold on. Let me close the, uh, the sharing uh, picture so that we can all see you on the screen. Uno momento, por favor. And boom. Okay. What is this? What's the meaning? Your mic is muted. You have to unmute your mic. Andy, you have to unmute your mic. We can't hear what you're... Are you Happier are those who dwell in Hashem's house. Forever. <laughs> Available for the very, very low price of 36... I don't know, how much is it? 72? Best offer. Best offer available, for, available for the best offer. We have Randy's art in our house hanging on the wall. It's 
very beautiful. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for joining. We'll see you, God willing, God willing next week, Tuesday. Yeah.